My name is Dr. Anthony Lemaire and I'm a cardiothoracic surgeon. Today we're going to talk about harvesting or procuring a heart for a heart transplant. Before I get started, I just want to go over two issues first. Number one, whenever I talk about procuring or harvesting a heart or any organ, I want to make sure I'm showing respect for not only the donor, but also the families of the donor. Because uh, although I'm extremely grateful for every time I've procured a heart, I also keep in mind that that donor had a family, had friends, and I want to be respectful to that family and to those family and friends. The second thing is I want to make sure I've gone over the anatomy of the heart so you know exactly what's happening when I'm removing, when I'm procuring it. So this is a model of the heart. I like to think of the heart in terms of sides. This is the right side, right atrium, right ventricle. Blood will classically go from the right atrium to the right ventricle. The right ventricle will then move blood to the pulmonary arteries, which will then provide blood to the lungs. In contrast, this is the left side, left atrium, left ventricle. Blood will go from the left atrium, left ventricle. The left ventricle will squeeze and push blood to this structure. This is the aorta. It's the largest blood vessel in the body. It will carry blood to the brain through these structures. It will go behind the heart and supply the other organs, the liver, the kidney, and the other extremities. Now, before someone can have their heart procured, there has to be constant communication between all the doctors involved. But before that, your donor has to, excuse me, the recipient at my institution has to have a donor. And, a, and that donor has to be a, essentially a perfect match. There has to be, the blood type has to be accurate, the size, and there's other factors too that make the patient um, a, a good match or a perfect match between the donor and the recipient. I won't go through all the details. But once we've been fortunate enough to receive a donor, at that time, I will then travel to the other institution after we've agreed on a time for the, donor, for the procurement. And I just want to mention that my constant communication is with the surgeons at the donor hospital, but also my colleagues at my institution that will be getting the recipient prepared as well. So once I've arrived at the other hospital, the first thing I do in coordination with the other surgeons is I will verify that what I was told about the donor is accurate. We'll look at blood type, making sure the patient was actually brain dead. All that is clarified. Once that's accurate and we've all um, agreed to it, we'll then bring the donor to the room, to the operating room. Once the donor is in the operating room, I, we, we will coordinate the start time. Now, just so you know, I, it's, when I'm procuring a heart for a heart transplant, um, there are other surgeons there also that are procuring organs, whether it's the lungs, the kidney, the liver, or even the pancreas. So it, the communication has to be really good between all of us, and the timing of what we do has to be accurate. Now, so we, the don't, let's just go through the process. The donor gets brought to the hospital uh, operating room, excuse me. The first thing we'll do is we'll do our timeout, which we'll review the patient's name and identification factors. At that time, we'll have a moment of silence, at which time we'll show appreci appreciation for the donor and also the donor's families. Afterwards, the patient will be prepared for surgery, prepped and draped, and then in coordination with the other surgeons, we'll then begin. I will take a scalpel, I'll make an incision in the patient's chest, and then I'll perform a median sternotomy, providing the most exposure I can for the heart. Once I've divided the sternum with the sternal saw, I'll place the sternal retractor, I'll open up the pericardium. As many of you might know, the pericardium is a wall that surrounds the heart. So I'll open that up and I'll retract it so I can provide good exposure to the heart. The first thing I do at this time is I look at the heart, I verify there's no anatomical abnormalities, and also that's functioning well, and that it's not either too big or too small for my recipient. Once I've agreed that the heart is good, I will communicate that to my team at my institution, which will then allow them to mobilize that recipient, get the patient to the operating room, and prepare for the transplant. Next, I will coordinate with the other surgeons that are actually at the donor hospital. Now, for example, if someone's taking the pancreas, the liver, or the, even the lungs, what I just went through with my recipient, they're going to be doing the same thing with theirs. And we have to agree on a time that we can actually begin the process of actually removing the organs. Now that time is referred to classically as the cross clamp time. That's the time where I will clamp the aorta and provide preservation fluid to the heart. Once I've clamped the heart, excuse me, once I've clamped the aorta, that the other surgeons cannot actually be technically removing or, or they can't actually be mobilizing their organs because they have to be, they have to have they have to be in constant communication with me because I have to make sure that when I clamp my aorta 
and subsequently removing the blood flow to the other organs, that they're, they're ready for that, essentially. So once we've agreed about that time, then I'll prepare the heart to be removed. Now by that, I mean mobilizing and freeing it up. The heart has multiple attachments that have to be removed or resected, or divided rather, before being removed. The first, the superior vena cava. Now the superior vena cava comes, go, or provides blood to the, uh, to the atrium, to the right atrium. And basically it drains, the, it gets blood drained from the upper, air, the upper extremities. And so basically the, the superior vena cava will, has to be freed up. I also have to free up the inferior vena cava, which brings blood to the right atrium as well from the lower part of the body. Then I free up the left side of the heart. Now, in the, let's just say this scenario, the lungs are not being taken. When the lungs are being taken with the heart, that uh, the, 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 there's some nuances of how we do that. And I'm gonna make it very simple and say, in this scenario, the lungs aren't being taken. So what I will do is I will divide the pulmonary veins, which go into the left atrium, and that will essentially free up the pulmonary, uh, the left atrium, excuse me. I will then free up the aorta, because the aorta and pulmonary artery are oftentimes attached. I will free that up. Next, I will then wait for the clamp time, the cross clamp time. Once we've, we agree to the cross clamp time, I will then divide the, or excuse me, I will, I will ligate, or I will ligate the superior vena cava. I don't want any blood going into the heart that is not the preservation fluid. So I will ligate the superior vena cava. I will open or vent the inferior vena cava, and that's because when I'm providing perfusion or preservation fluid, I don't want the heart to get distended and therefore the incision into the inferior vena cava is gonna allow the, the heart to be vented, essentially. I will then divide the pulmonary veins so the left side of the heart is being vented. It's very important that the heart is not being distended or filled up when you're providing preservation fluid. I will then clamp the aorta so that nothing is getting into the aorta, and then I will provide a cannula into the aorta and provide preservation fluid so that the fluid can get throughout the, can go directly into the coronary arteries, into the heart. Now, I'm not sure if I mentioned it, but preservation fluid is critical to this process. You have to be able to provide the heart fluid substances so that when I'm taking it out of the body and transporting it to another institution to be implanted, the heart's not gonna get injured. And there's different preservation fluids, but the one that we use is University of Wisconsin fluid. So what I will do is I will give two liters of preservation fluid to the heart. And all during that time, those of the time of the preservation fluid being in, uh, infused, I'm checking the heart's not getting dilated or distended. Once the two liters are in, I will then completely divide the inferior vena cava attachments, divide the pulmonary vein attachments, and free up the entire pulmonary, the left atrium. I will divide the aorta and free it up, divide the pulmonary artery, and finally divide the superior vena cava. Now, I didn't mention it, but there's an azicus vein, which is a vein that comes posterior to the superior vena cava. I will ligate that as well. Once the heart's entirely freed up, I remove it. I will then verify that there is no anatomical abnormalities. And then I will place it in another bag with preservation fluid. I will classically place it in three bags with preservation fluid. I'll place it in a cooler and then transport it to my institution for implant. Now, there's different, different systems in which you can take the organ and put it into a cooling system, a, just a, a, ge a generic cooler with ice. But there's actually other more sophisticated systems which you can actually have the heart connected to a system that's going to constantly keep it at a, a certain temperature and also provide a preservation fluid as well. Once again, I'll take the organ to my institution for implant. So this is a basic review of how I remove a heart uh, which is um, for a heart transplant, uh, again, either procuring it or harvesting. If you have any questions or comments, please let me know. Thank you very much.